So we've talked a little bit about how the idea of virtualization is not the same as emulation. So we provide a reasonably like virtual environment to the physical environment. It's a pretty standard x86, x64 type PC based on things that the operating systems designed for that type of platform expect to see. So it all works reasonably well and with good performance, but virtualization does have overhead. So when we start running very high workloads, what we may find is that providing a complete virtualization of a device is not quite as useful as providing a more lightweight virtualization or what they call para-virtualization of a device. So there's two devices that we can use para-virtualization with, SCSI controllers and also the network adapters. So if we take a look, you'll notice in my virtual machine properties that my current SCSI controller is an LSI Logic Serial Attached SCSI. This is well supported by Windows 2008, which is the OS I'm running in that guest. It's a modern driver. It's going to be supported in the future. It allows me to detect it and boot and install to it directly during the installation of Windows because the driver's already included. So it's a very convenient driver and it works pretty well for most uses. Under heavy I.O. load, we're going to see higher CPU utilization because we need to do more to virtualize it. We're doing a more complete virtualization. I don't want to mess with my boot disk and potentially cause problems in a blue screen or something like that. So what I may want to do is add another hard drive. And when I do that, it's going to give me the option to add a new SCSI adapter. So I'm going to create a new disk here. I'll just leave default options. That's fine. In the end, it's going to give me the option to select my virtual device node. So SCSI 01 means SCSI ID 1 on the first controller. So in this list, we start with SCSI ID 1 on SCSI controller 0. If I go to SCSI controller 1, it's going to add a SCSI controller for me. So in this case, SCSI controller 1 ID 0 is going to be my new disk. And each of the SCSI adapters can support up to 15 devices because there's 15 IDs available and we can have as many as four SCSI adapters in the same virtual machine. So 60 virtual drives. By choosing SCSI 1 in this case, now it's going to add a new SCSI adapter for me, and you'll see that in bold, it's adding a new hard drive and also adding a new SCSI controller. If I change the type to VMware Para Virtual, I'll be using the PV SCSI driver, which I need VMware tools installed for, but at that point, this driver under heavy I.O. loads uses 10 to 15% less CPU resources, so it will perform better. They say not to use this if you're not under heavy I.O. load because you'll use more CPU under lower load, but you'll use less CPU under higher load. So that could potentially be useful for things such as databases and others that might be really pushing I.O. And if we look at my network adapter, this out of the box is an Intel E1000. If I go ahead and click Add, and choose another Ethernet adapter, we'll see that I have the option to pick the VMX Net 2 or VMX Net 3 adapter. And for a modern operating system where we're going to have significant network load, the VMX Net 3 is the way to go. I can't boot off of the network with it and things like that, but it's pretty good. Now you'll notice that I can't really change the type. I'll see it, you know, adapter type, current adapter VMX Net 3, or if I go to my earlier one, current adapter E1000. I can't change it, but I can remove it and re-add it. For your network adapter, that's reasonably safe. You might have to provide settings and things again in your guest. For your SCSI controller, it's really not safe, and you're probably going to blue screen windows unless you put the settings back just the way that they were. Let's take a look from a Windows perspective at some of the things that might impact you. I'm going to go ahead, I'm just going to open a separate console so it's a little bit easier to navigate, and I'm going to go ahead and put it in full screen. One of the things that can help with performance inside of the virtual machines, or one of the things to consider, is display performance, especially if you're going to be using this for any kind of interactive work. So if you go into the display settings in Windows Control Panel, you can go in and go to Advanced Settings. If you go over to the Troubleshoot tab, typically you shouldn't need to change these, and I guess I'm not running Control Panel as administrator or something, but if you have weird cursor issues and things like that, potentially changing these troubleshooting settings can be useful for disabling problematic services. However, it definitely does impact the performance of video. So we definitely want to make sure these settings are maximized if they're available. And we also have the display bells and whistles, I suppose we could say, of Windows. So if we take a look at that and we go into things like the appearance and the display settings, 
we may want to turn off some of those things. Let's go take a look at the system properties. So I'm in the control panel. I'm going to go to system. So inside here, if we click over on the left hand side, you'll see under the advanced tab of the system properties, there's a performance section. A couple of things to be aware of. We can turn on various visual effects in Windows. Well, there's a setting that says adjust for best performance. Some of this can actually be quite CPU intensive. In modern Windows, on hardware, it's typically hardware rendered now. Things like the Aero desktop are rendered by your actual video card. Now that we're moving those things back to software, they can still be quite expensive. So turn them off, definitely. And if you take a look over at Advanced, we can specify whether we want to adjust for best performance or programs or services. Typically, for example, Windows XP will be optimized for programs, or Windows 7 will be optimized for programs. And what that does is it actually gives it a longer quantum length. So the amount of time given during each time slice for Windows when CPU scheduling occurs, occurs in longer blocks. And this helps with like interactivity of the system and so on. On a single user interactive system, that could be useful. On servers, typically we're gonna have it optimized for background services, so if we're running desktops in a server type environment, we may want to move those over to background services. If you're using it as interactive virtual desktop, maybe even though it's running Windows Server for developer purposes or something, we might want to adjust for performance of programs. And then as for the paging file, it's very important, even though VMware has its own swap capability, and we can even use things like solid state caching for swap, it's very important that you have whatever swap functionality is available in your guest turned on. So in Windows, you know, setting it to automatically manage the settings, you might want to tune that, but definitely it should be on. For example, on Linux, we can use commands like swap on to specify where we want to do swap, what devices we want to use it on. It's a good idea to configure that. So if we have multiple virtual drives in our virtual machine, we may want to place swap on a specific virtual drive because it's associated with a particular physical disk, solid state or something like that, or just fast drives or drives with more capacity or what have you. So we can optimize the placement of the VMware swap, but we definitely want our guests to do swap themselves as well. And the balloon driver is going to help influence how they swap. So good idea to leave them turned on, managed and so forth. But if you want to tune them and add additional swap files or something, that can be done. Generally, you're not going to need to, but it's available there. One thing I would suggest is that virtual machines typically will have better video performance over Windows Remote Desktop than they will using the VMware console protocol. So if you're connecting to virtual machines over high latency network links or low bandwidth network links, then definitely Remote Desktop is a better protocol. There's more options for tuning how the video is going to perform and what visual effects are or are not brought over, depending on what's done in the VM and what resolution you use and all of those things. Definitely look at Windows Remote Desktop connection as a good alternative. And then you don't need to provide any permissions in VMware for people who simply need to access the console of a virtual server. They can do that through remote desktop. We don't need to provide them with the vSphere client. We don't need to train them on how to not break our entire vSphere environment and lock down our permissions for them, all those things. Now, of course, you'll have to manage that configuration, maybe through group policy or by setting it up in your template VM before you start cloning all the different other virtual machines.